Here on this Tobacco University video, we're looking at the overview of spectrum effects on cannabis production. So here we're going to take a look at some of the different spectrums and some of the effects they have on plants. So first off, I should start with a general summary, and this provides a quick visual and textual summary of the major classifications of the different spectrums. In addition to the main impact on the plant is also provided, meaning when we look at UV light, that can slow growth and enhance oil production in relation to cannabis. For blue light, they can reduce cell expansion and cause plants to be shorter. Green light does penetrate leaves and does facilitate human vision in diagnosis of different uh, plant diseases or potential nutrient deficiencies. Red light is very efficient for the photosynthetic process, and far red light can enhance cell expansion and cause plants to stretch. So if you give plants blue and far red, you kind of have some competingness there. One wants it to keep straight, keep um, stretch. One wants it to keep it short and stocky. So again, the amount and kind of proportions of these you give a plant can impact its morphological outcome. So looking at just the general McKee curve um, here. So the McKee curve was developed in the late 1960s to early 1970s. It was an attempt to understand how plants utilize light. Uh, interpret this with caution as the study was done with multiple points in uh, time data points that was put into a curve of a graph. So kind of like a bunch of little points they kind of made into a graph. Plants can adjust to their environments and plants will make the most of the light available to them, which may result in changes in their morphology. So just again, keep that also in mind that this is just a suggested curve and gives you just an idea of how plants um, may utilize uh, the light spectrum. Looking specifically at some details within this, looking at the UV light, so starting at that kind of 100 to 400 nanometer are the basics of UV light. UV radiation spectrum is divided into three regions called UVA, UVB, and UVC. As sunlight passes through the atmosphere, all of the UVC and most of the UV UVB is absorbed by the ozone, water vapor, oxygen, and carbon dioxide, meaning plants will be exposed to it less uh, than if they were, say, growing um, outside of Earth, say, the International Space Station. UVA is not filtered as significantly by the atmosphere, so it's able to penetrate and reach the surface of Earth to a little bit higher degree. The UV region covers the wavelengths range from 100 to 400 nanometers and is divided into those three bands, UVA being 315 to 400 nanometers, UVB 280 to 315, UVC 100 to 280 nanometers. The relatively long wavelength UVA accounts for approximately 95% of the UV radiation reaching Earth's surface, just to put that in perspective there. With increasing altitude and there's less atmosphere, is available to absorb UV radiation. So with every 1,000 meters in altitude, UV levels increase by approximately 10%, just showing you the impact elevation or distance from sea level can have. Now UV in plants response, so let's relate this now to back to the plants. UV light response in plants is similar to blue light meaning UV does not drive photosynthesis and can also trigger cannabinoid synthesis and potentially reduce disease. UV light does cause some stress to the plant, so they may develop thicker leaves and or protective compounds, as we see here in the plant uh, pictured, with pigmentation such as anthocyanins, that purple coloration. Some plants will do this naturally, but if we're seeing that, that is a response usually to some sort of stress. In this case, it could be a light stress from UV light. Here's a new look at some old data. So this was kind of interesting uh, research kind of I came across and some interpreta interpretation of that research. So Dr. Bugby's lab in Utah State University investigated physics uh, Kenneth McKee's data from the 1970s in relative photosynthetic efficiency. Looking at the data, the error bars represent a range of plant species from the paper showing small variations among species when grown in the field. The growth chamber of plants indicated larger variability, and we kind of see that here with the lines kind of being a little bit larger um, here in the growth chamber, a little bit smaller overall in the field. The question is, uh, is it possible that field-grown plants, the ones here at the top, have synthesized compounds to block UV for the protection of light, reducing the effectiveness of those wavelengths. And we're seeing that here's our line, here's our UV radiation. We're seeing in the field less, um, a much reduced kind of amount of relative quantum yield. And in the growth chamber, yes, the variability is greater, but we're seeing an increase in that curve. 
is it possible because of the high intensity of lights that the field grown crops have to deal with, are they producing compounds that are blocking out some of that UV light to help protect them from potential damaging effects? So just kind of a unique look at some older data. Now those blue photons, as I mentioned before, blue photons reduce cell expansion. So it's gonna to tend to keep plants a little bit shorter and a little bit stockier. Blue photons, uh, as a result, keep the plants shorter, reduce leaf expansion. Here's 5% blue, here's 20% blue. We see that plant is definitely um, stockier, shorter internodes. This morphology difference in cannabis plants grown under 5% blue versus 20% blue light, we do see pretty evident there just on the picture, um, the reduction in plant height. And then we get into talking about green light. So while plants are green, indicating that the green wavelengths are reflected by the plants, this does not mean these are wasted wavelengths. A lot of people think, oh, why should I give them green light? It's just a waste. Really, that's not the case. Green wavelengths of light penetrate deep into the leaf and are absorbed by certain plant pigments, which are of benefit to the plant. Chlorophyll may have reduced absorbance of green wavelengths, but this is not the only plant pigment, so keep that in mind. There's other plant compounds in the plant than just chlorophyll. We see that particularly in areas that have deciduous trees that change color as the fall time approaches. We see an expression of those pigments when chlorophyll is degraded. Now, green photons and plant diagnosis. So green photons as part of white light allows growers to see the plants and better diagnose potential problems. It is much easier here to look at the plants under this kind of full spectrum light than this high par purpley light uh, to diagnose for diseases, look for potentially nutrient deficiencies, and that's really important to catch things early. So while the plants may grow well under both, this white light would be better to be able for the grower to diagnose plant problems at a much earlier stage when it's easier to control them. So red photons, again, in the 640 to 700 nanometer wavelength and plant response, what's kind of looking like uh, with these different wavelengths. Well, red LEDs are among the most efficient at converting electricity into photosynthetic photons and are relatively inexpensive. This is why you typically see a lot of red um, LEDs. Chlorophyll strongly absorbs red light, and this it's effective at photosynthesis. Great um, benefit there. Many plants grow under only red light, and no blue will have a stretched, tall appearance, thin, large um, leaves. So keep that in mind, that just because it's a great light to what looks like would be a good plant response, it's going to cause plants to kind of have a stretched, kind of exaggerated, tall appearance. Leaves might be large, it could be thin, uh, that could cause some issues there. So this is why we want to give plants kind of a mixed light. This is a reason why we see a lot of red light given to plants uh, in growth chambers and indoor grows in general. Then we talk about something here called the far red wavelength. So a little different than just the red, we're now in that far red, which is 700 to 800 nanometers. Far red light is in a range of light that the extreme red end of the visual spectrum just before you get to the infrared light. Usually regarded as a region between 700 and 800 nanometers in wavelengths and is dimly visible to human eyes. So keep that in mind that we're kind of pushing the edge there of the visible spectrum. Far red and plant response. How do plants respond to far red light? Well, far red is critical spectrum for plants as it's utilized in the photosynthetic process and can cause an impact on plants' shape. Far red is also perceived by plants' photoreceptor, the phytochrome, which is important for light detection, and also timing and flowering in some plants. So that far red kind of drives the PR to the PFR, the active to inactive form. You can force a plant from the active to inactive form uh, quicker uh, with the addition of far red light. And we see here the regular plant uh, and then plant grown with far red, how it definitely increases the height, the internet spacing and the stretching of that plant. Now we talked earlier about light penetration. We'll notice the difference across the different colors of how light penetrates into the leaf. For blue, we're looking at light absorbed in the top layer. For green, the light penetrates deep into the leaf. Red, kind of similar to the blue and with light only being absorbed in that kind of top layer. But then that important far red is also penetrating deep into the leaf as well. That's just important consideration when we're looking at how these, how these um, wavelengths might be utilized by the plant. So that blue versus far red um, wavelength. So far red will enhance cell expansion, which is essentially the opposite of blue photons. They kind of like play off one another. Plants grown indoors with 80 to 90% red light and 10 to 20% blue light are quite compact with small leaves and shorter stems. We see the white versus far red versus plus 
10% far red here. It's very important with lettuce and with other plants as it will cause plants to grow very tall. We want to be mindful of you know, how tall we're letting our plants get, how leggy we might be getting them. Uh, looking at our seedlings, if we're looking at shipping seedlings, we don't want to grow these large top heavy seedlings, they may break during transportation. With the lettuce here, we're seeing our white versus our adding our 10% can definitely increase that leaf surface area. Uh, and that's typically what's being bought and purchased because you're looking at the salad production. So that can really help increase production per plant there by increasing that amount of surface area. This shows seedlings grown at 68 degrees Fahrenheit for four weeks under LEDs for 18 hours a day at 160 micromoles uh, per meter squared per second, consisting of 100% red and 50 blue, 50% red. And you can see how that morphology difference is quite staggering with the red being much taller and the mix, even mix of blue and red being much shorter. So that quick general summary of everything I kind of mentioned here, photon color, blue, green, red, and far red, and look at the impact on the plant. Blue photons inhibit cell expansion, keep them short and squatty. Green photons aid with human vision to be able to diagnose plants visually for nutrients or potential disease issues. Red photons are very efficient at photosynthesis. Far red photons increase cell expansion. Now, if you want to learn more, if this is of interest to you, uh, to learn a little bit more about this, I would direct you to researching some of these scientists here to provide you with some more information. They have a great and lots of work out there. So by all means, take a look, search, search them up, where you can learn a little bit more about the impact of photons and wavelengths on plant production.